Hello, hello, welcome, welcome to the Say La Vie podcast episode 5. I know we're all happy that we have this opening music back to the original. We've been spending so much time together these past two weeks with episode 4 and then the launch event and now we have an episode lined up for you with a brilliant conversation with Brian Gignac from MCDC. I always say it, one of my favorite parts of this job is having these conversations and learning about people, learning about experiences and stories that I would never be able to even imagine. And it's those mind-boggling experiences that you hear that drive my curiosity for life, that drive my curiosity for learning and adventuring. And this conversation that we have with Brian today is a perfect example of that. Last week, we spoke a lot about how COVID is affecting students and youth from across this province, but we didn't really speak a lot about the youth from these rural areas. And so this conversation with Brian was very eye-opening to me and humbled me, made me reflect on my own privilege of living in some of these metropolitan areas and some of the advantages that I'm provided that I take for granted. So this conversation really drove a lot of introspection for myself, and I hope it will for you too. Hearing the experiences of things that happen right next door, maybe only a few hours away, is crazy to think of how extremely the lifestyles are shifted depending on where you are. Brian also provides some helpful insights on how you can get involved to make communities a better place for everyone, not only your own, but the communities around you that are struggling. So without further ado, here we are today with Brian, and uh, Brian, I'll let you introduce yourself, your organization, and a bit of the stuff you guys do. Hey, thank you very much, Sanfried, for the invitation. So uh, I'm Brian Gignac. I'm the executive director of an organization called MCDC. We're based out in uh, chaudière appalaches uh, roughly an hour south of Quebec City, and we've been providing services to the English-speaking community for 20 years now. That's amazing. And so everywhere in Quebec, all these conversations that I've been having, people seem to be experiencing a bit of a uniform experience, something that we all go through. But then each community has their own sort of challenges, something that's very unique to them and not experienced by a lot of other communities. Yeah, well, I mean, COVID has uh, tested our capacity as an organization to be creative, innovative, and most of all, be flexible. Number one reality we had to face I mean, most community organizations were not prepared to go virtual and do some online stuff. I mean, the core of our business is meeting people. We're people-driven organizations. So just the fact that we had to rethink our, our business model of how we communicate with our clientele was a learning curve. Just getting the technology uh, was difficult. And I mean, we have a, a reality here where I have people living in an urban area, but I also have some of my community members that are out there in the country. So, I mean, high-speed internet is an issue. Uh, Some of them don't even own a computer. So how do you uh, communicate vital information to your community when these things happen? So, yeah, we had to uh, dig deep and rethink how we were going to do stuff. But I think we pulled ourselves really great. I'm really proud of the team, really proud of the community. Uh, It's been testing, but we made it through and we're still going strong. Absolutely. And I I think that's also a bit of a reflection on how the society had to answer to a pandemic of this magnitude. You saw this immediate jump to everything going online, but you'd imagine that all these communities have access to Wi-Fi. We live in Canada, right? But no, there's a lot of communities where having these kind of video chats like we're having right now are not even possible. And so a lot of the conversations I've been having with students is about how they feel like they have a strong lack of resources. These students that are coming internationally don't have access to to Wi-Fi or or high-speed internet, laptops, things like this, and not everyone's being provided it. So it's it's really interesting to see how as a technology continued to advance, how dependent we're becoming on it. And I think the pandemic has really kind of exposed that. Oh, for sure. Just in schools, uh, not every school were equipped either with laptops, tablets, when everyone was sent back home. Uh, I mean, stores... Uh, you wanted to order a tablet, a computer. It was back order for weeks, for months. So it was a challenge. And it's quite surprising being in a civilized country in Canada. You're not expecting this, this lack of resources. So imagine when you're talking to your seniors who have gone through a lot in life 
But I mean, for them, losing the touch with their their friends, their families, of not seeing them, uh, in some cases, technology could help them. But in other cases, they were isolated even more than before. So they're they're the ones also who have been impacted, and it's been a challenge for them. Mm-hmm. So so talk to me a bit about that. Talk to me about how the people in your community are really being affected by this. Because obviously I have I have a Montreal perspective and I have a, a suburban West Island perspective on how COVID is affecting us. But I want to hear from you because it seems to me more and more, the more people I talk to, the more I realize there's this huge lack of understanding of the lifestyles in rural Quebec. Yeah, well, like I said in the intro, our community is divided between an urban setting. So Thetford Mines, where our head office is, is small town, about 26,000 people. You do have taxis, a lot of the services you would uh, find elsewhere. However, half of my membership is out in rural communities. And when I, talk, when I say rural, some of the villages have 350 souls. They don't even have a grocery store there. Some of them don't even have, forget a convenience. Uh, The gas station is in another village. So I do have these isolated community members where life can be a bit more challenging. So for them, the only socialization they would have before the pandemic was actually coming to some of our activities. But when group activities were put on hold March 13th of last year, uh, it was a major impact because some of them, they'd come to our activities, whether it was once, twice a week, and then they end up seeing no one. Some of them don't even have family nearby. So MCDC for them is who they rely, who they call. I mean, just to chat, just to check up. So one thing that we had to do was let's get, get on the phone. Let's call these people just to see who who's doing well, who is facing challenges. And I even participated in that. So I was calling community members, just seeing how they were doing. So we had to move there on the phone. We had to help some of our seniors just ordering grocery. Imagine if you're in a rural area like they are. And I think I'm happy you said that, like in Montreal, in the urban setting, you could get along if you don't know that much of French. But in my MRC, English speakers represent 1.2% of the whole population. So here you do need French language skills to get along. But if you're, you haven't polished them, that's where we come in. So we had to help some of our seniors order their groceries online, make sure they were getting deliveries, anything that had to do with uh, prescription drugs from the pharmacy, stuff like that. So we really got pretty close and personal with some of some of the members helping them out. Uh, so it's a different thing. We had to even set up volunteer transportation for them. So no, it, it, it has been challenging. Uh, they've been impacted, but uh, overall we were able to, uh, to support them really well. And that's, that's so cool because it seems like if it weren't for organizations like MCDC, a huge portions of these populations that, like you said, even though we make up like 1%, right, in these rural areas, they're still unaccounted for. Who would be who would be getting those prescriptions for those elderly people that can't do that communication? Who would be going to uh, these doctor's appointments to explain their symptoms? This is important work that needs to be done. And it's like, it really, really makes me happy to hear of the work you guys do. Because I think it's important. And I think it's, it's like easy to n- neglect or not not look at these populations because they're a minority in in these rural towns but they're still just as important their livelihoods are just as important they are and i mean when i look generally speaking at the whole administrative region of la chaudière appalache we're talking about 425,000 people so the biggest city is Livy. so you've got Livy, you've got saint georges thetford that are more uh urban but the rest is rural and what's surprising is MCDC is the only English speaking organization in that whole territory. That's unbelievable. So, so we are one organization providing direct services to the English speaking community. And if you would be talking to some of my colleagues in other regions, they have the same issue. They are probably the only uh, organization out there providing services to the English speaking community. 
So the type of work we do is so vital because we provide a lot of information. How do you want to influence the government if information is only available in French? Well, you need to speak with your representative saying, hey, you got to think about our community members. Is there any way we can get some material translated into English? Come and work with, with the MCDC. We'll help you. We'll provide you access to that English-speaking community. So our job becomes one of making sure that information is available. And I mean, yes, there's the internet, but when you're in a rural area and you don't have a computer or the cost of high-speed internet is too much, how do you get your information? Uh, so they rely heavily on our monthly down, uh, newsletter called the Down Home News. Uh, I mean, we um, we provide it to over 200 households in the area. And to some of our members, we actually go and drop it off directly in their mailbox. So that's for them, that newsletter is the only piece of information in English they'll probably get in the month. But that's astounding because how I, I can't even begin to fathom that, especially at a time so volatile like this pandemic, this entire time. I feel like most of this year has spent, uh, I've spent looking at news because there's so much going on. So f for you to say that some of the only English media they're provided by their provincial government comes from your newsletters that are then translated in English, it's astounding to me because that is essentially involuntarily cutting them off from all this vital information that they're just not being provided. You, you said it earlier that one of the most important things that your organization does is information. And it makes so much sense now because without that information, it's, it's, it's a matter of safety. They need that information to uh, procure their safety, to ensure that their family are safe with the newest measures. But if they don't get that information, it's, it, that's scary. It's scary yeah. to think about that. It is because a lot of it is, uh, I mean, yes, you could always listen out to what's going on on CBC, different news networks. But I mean, what's happening directly in your own community, um, a lot of these larger medias, do not necessarily come uh, in our neck of the woods to inform people. So yes, it means uh, talking to all your partners, talking to the CIS and saying, look, I have, I'm faced with this issue in our community. Can you help us? And I have to say, they've done a wonderful job. So when we talk with them, they are open to helping us. I mean, here in Thetford, we have one of the uh, vaccination centers. So what they did for the English speaking community is making sure that they have at least one or two staff when people are getting vaccinated that have some knowledge of English. So if there are uh, some of our members going out there, well, they'll at least get some of the services. So we collaborate really closely with them and say, well, uh, we know of 10 people that speak English, they will be vaccinated on such and such a day. So would you please be sure to have maybe more volunteers available who can help them? And so it's all about building partnerships. So after 20 years, we've done, uh, we have some great partners. And I mean, the work that we do as community organization is, is creating that awareness that there is a minority group and we need to take time to work with them. Uh, and all our partners are really great, and they've they look up to our knowledge as an organization on how to improve their services. So I've never been faced with a partner saying, "No, we're not doing that." They have always, "Yes, but we need your expertise." So that's what we've been doing. And if it wouldn't have been for that collaboration, it would have been really hard. In the last weeks, we've been setting up appointments for our community members to get vaccinated. When, when we're talking about these people who do not have access to a computer, well, if you're trying to call the 1-800 number to set up your appointment, you might spend hours on the phone. So, I mean, we helped them up. We set over 50 appointments in the last few weeks for community members just to get vaccinated. That's impressive. That's a, that's a 
that's a pretty big feat and especially with some of the reluctance and the lack of information we were talking about it's it's important to have these these programs to get people vaccinated because honestly at the end of the day it is the only key to get life back to to the way it is you know i think there's there's a there's a message of hope there because i think we are reaching a turning point and it seems like in the in the first part of this year as a community in montreal or in quebec a lot of these communities really got together and and supported each other and i know like now with recent events such as the riots that have happened in downtown montreal with um you know the teacher strikes going on i know that times are now a bit more volatile in our province than they have been with this pandemic but the work that has been done in these communities should not be forgotten. It should be continued to be highlighted because it shows it shows what, what we as a province do. It shows what we as a province have done for each other. And though there are bad things happening right now, it should not drown out the amazing work that's being done. So I'm really happy that we got to talk to you today, Brian, and uh, have these conversations about the work you do because there are tremendous people across this province continuing to do great work for their communities like Brian brian like the mcdc and um ton of others so first of all i mean like i said thank you very much for having me on your uh podcast it's great that we're taking the pulse from what's going on in the regions community organizations have been so vital throughout this pandemic and i'm happy because all of my partners that are in the community sector have done an amazing job we can all be proud of what we do and we've become that middle person between government and the public so we do have a vital role and it's through community organizations that we can make important advancements for our community so that's my positive note say continue to support community organizations and to some of the people listening in if you have a community organization in your area well give them a call see what they can do for you and you'd be amazed of all the possibilities out there we're always looking for volunteers we're looking for people who want to help so give your organizations a call and see what you can do because they also need a lot of help absolutely and as always i'm going to keep a link to all the resources of different community organizations at the y for y website under the podcast section you will be able to find a list of resources links to organizations such as mcdc that continue to put on events and do these workshops and outreach to people that's vital it's a vital pillar to keeping these communities safe during times of crisis so thank you again brian and i appreciate you being on here and telling us a bit about the world in, the, in your neck of the woods well thank you very much it was a pleasure that was a wonderful conversation that i thoroughly enjoyed having and it really echoed a lot of the words of concern and empowerment that we heard in the launch event these ideas of isolation these ideas of reaching out to your community organizations to see how big of an impact you can truly make it's all stuff that really matters and so i'd like to thank brian for echoing those words and thank all of you for keeping these voices heard and for taking the time to learn and explore what's happening in your community for those of you that are interested to now go out and get involved in your community organizations, we will have a resource page full of them at the end of this episode that you can find in the description of wherever you're listening to it. And at Why for Why, we have a wonderful volunteering program that you can learn all about in our website. So thank you again, everyone. You guys have heard enough from me today, so I'm going to end this off with a beautiful song written by local Quebec talent who goes by the name of Renan. This is her first single, My Love, and you will have all the links to go and show it some love in the description below. So friends, until next time, remember, you are the culture. We are the culture. So keep making your voices heard and let's keep building upon this ever-changing mosaic that is the Quebec identity. Biting my nails I've got a problem with when no else just fails Maybe a kiss is enough Cause I give and they take It seems worth it Yeah, I give and he takes I can't help it this
with that comes an end to episode 5. Thank you all for keeping these voices heard. Thank you to Renon for providing her beautiful music to this podcast. A special thanks to Canadian Heritage for supporting this project. And thank you to Upford Network for helping in its editing. The support that I've gotten on this podcast over the past couple of months has inspired me to continue working hard to bring you these stories every single week. So I'm really glad you guys have been enjoying this podcast. I've been enjoying making this podcast. And I'm excited to bring you some wonderful people in the weeks to come. So until next time, stay safe and have a lovely day.